how easily we forget that. That while we were wandering, while we were in sin, sin pressed, sin bound, hell bound, somebody prayed for us. Now, you may not know who it was that prayed for you. They may not know who you were as they prayed for you. But I'll be so bold as to say, I'm not thoroughly convinced that salvation comes without somebody praying for the wanderer. Now, don't ask me to give you all the details of that particular theology. <laughs> but prayer is an, an instrumental, if not a necessity, in the salvation of the soul. And so let us not forget that we should be praying for those who are outside of Christ, those who are wandering in this world, and those who are fearful. Why do we not fear the Lord? That's the question that lays before us today from our text in Psalm chapter, uh, Psalm chapter 2. Why don't we fear the Lord? Why is it that we seem to be afraid of virtually everything else other than God? Why is it that we lay awake at night or are consumed in our thoughts during the day of what our boss may do to us or what a coworker may do to us or what the bully at school might do to us when we forget completely what God said he will do to us? We, are, we have swapped or, or traded, if you will, what men may do for what God will do. Now, as we are told not to fear those that can only kill the body and after that have no other power, but that we ought to fear the one that after he's killed the body can consign the soul to hell. As we think about that most famous verse from the Lord Jesus Christ, I actually find great comfort in that because I know what God has said, right? Don't you? Don't you know that God has said in his word that because of our sin, we stand alienated to a holy God, that God is holy, God is sovereign, God is perfect, God is good, God is loving, God is kind, but God is also just. And in our sin, we're alienated from God. That means we are separated from God. And that if we die in that condition, we will be eternally separated from God, right? We know God has told us that. God's Word, the Bible, tells us this truth about who God is and who we are in a way that we understand, right? And we also know that God has said that if we desire to be reconciled to Him, that it must be through His Son, Jesus Christ, right? Uh, there's a large portion of the Scripture that teaches us this. And we can know it, and we can hear it, and we can understand it clearly. And so God tells us, in a sense, up front, what's going on and what needs to happen. And he also tells us that once we are reconciled to him through his Son, that we have the forgiveness of sins and we are granted eternal life in the presence, in his presence, in heaven, right? So why should we ever trade what God has said he will do for those things that men say they might do or may do. Why? Why would we ever do that? And that's going to be the theme of our time today. That I think for most of us, we find ourselves in this, in this position, in this spot, where we have traded what God said he will do for what men say they might do. And, be, and because of that, we are in great fear. Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in, heavens, in the heavens laughs the Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and testify 
or excuse me, terrified them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, that is the S-O-N, not the sun in the sky, but the Lord Jesus, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Father, we thank you for the day that you have given to us, for the song sung and the prayers prayed and the word already delivered. We thank you, Father, for the assembly of the saints in this place, for the worship of you as our holy God. And we ask, Father, now that as we embark upon this text, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and most of all, hearts that are ready to receive all that you have for us, and that we would learn in this hour not to fear men, but to fear you. And Father, as we reflect upon even that thought, may it not be an unhealthy fear, but may, be, may it be a holy and a righteous reverence of you, but truly a fear of you also in your judgment and your wrath. And that, Father, you would purify a people and continue to purify a people for your own possession. We thank you, Father. We praise you. We glorify you. And we ask these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. There's a story from World War I of an English soldier who was converted in the trenches in France. And he wrote his mother and said, This war had to occur that I might be saved. The mother showed the letter from her son to her minister, remarking to the minister that she thought the boy was unduly magnifying the importance of his salvation. The minister actually agreed with the young man and said, Oh, no, 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 oh, not only is this war, but Calvary had to occur to save your son. God used the wrath which raged both at Calvary and through this awful war experience to bring the lad to his Savior. Now, as it just so happens, I had forgotten that this was my opening illustration for this morning, and yesterday evening I found myself having a bit of time and so I actually watched the movie 1917 last night, which is all about World War I. And I, I appreciated the depiction in that movie. It wasn't overly grotesque and it wasn't overly violent, but it depicted the scenes of trench warfare, I thought, very well. And, and the point I'm making is, is that as, you, as we think about things like World War I or World War II or the violence that may be occurring on our streets, it is very easy for us to become concerned and fearful about the circumstances that surround us. We can become very fearful about perhaps a doctor's visit that we have or tests that are outstanding. We can be very fearful about whether or not my job is going to continue or whether my livelihood is going to be there to pay the bills. We can be very fearful over the things that our, our children experience, maybe as they go to school or as they engage in various activities. There's a lot of fear in the world because there's a lot of lostness in the world. And yet, what I find in this opening illustration is that God uses even our fear to bring us to Christ. That he brings those circumstances like World War I brought this young man into salvation. Calvary brought this young man into salvation. That God uses those circumstances in our life to draw us unto himself. And we forget that. And so 
part of my time today is to remind us that we must not fear the things of the world, but we must look to see what God is doing through those things to bring us to repentance or bring us into faith for the first time, and that our only real source of fear is what God is doing, not what men, is, what men are doing. And yet I find that many of us in what we call evangelical life actually are more afraid of what men may do than what God has said he will do. I piloted that, introduced that thought to us a bit ago, that we are afraid of what men might do, the threats that men make that, that take away our temporal comforts, that, that may take away our earthly life. We, we are fearful of what men say they may do instead of being afraid of what God says he will do. And I think that's what the psalmist is laying out for us. Obviously, the second thought on our road trip today is that Christ reminds us of his sovereignty over all things and his absolute rulership over the created order, that we need not be afraid of these things that men say they will do because Christ is sovereign. Yesterday in our conference, the speaker used a term that at first Sounded a bit odd to me, but the more he said it, the more I embraced it and loved it. He kept saying, King Jesus, King Jesus. Now, I really thought it, was, thought it was kind of strange that a Presbyterian would keep saying King Jesus, but he kept saying it. And I said, I, think, I like that because Christ Jesus is king. Christ Jesus is sovereign. Christ Jesus wasn't just sovereign in the days of the Bible, but Christ Jesus, King Jesus is sovereign now. Over this world, over those things that, that really bother us, those things that concern us, the things we're afraid of, Jesus is sovereign over those things. He, he is truly King Jesus, and we need to remember that. Which will lead us to the third thing this morning on our road trip, that we must remember that the only safe place is abiding in Christ. The only safe place is abiding in Christ. Christ. The only safe place for our marriage is abiding in Christ. The only safe place in our workplace is abiding in Christ. The only safe place in the difficulties that we face in our own life and the fears that we have and the reservations and the hesitations that we experience, the only safe place is Christ. The only safe place is Christ. The only safe place is Christ. Well, that's where we're going today, and so I hope you will join me in this trek. This is, uh, to use my analogy that I've used with several of you guys as we've talked, we are taking steps. We are ascending the summit. We haven't necessarily made it to the top yet, but we're getting there, but we're following the path that Christ has laid before us as we face the danger, the cliffs, the overhangs, the glaciers, the crevices, the wild animals, as we face the dangers on this journey together, we need not be afraid of those things around us, not, not ignorant of those things around us. We don't need to be stupid. But we need not to be afraid, for we are following in the path of the one, the forerunner, who has gone before us, the Lord Jesus. And as long as we follow him and attach to his connection points and go across the bridges that he has laid for us, we will be fine. But we need not be afraid. Right? Y'all ready to go? Everybody got their climbing boots on? Got their ice axes and their climbing hooks with them? We're all tethered together, so let's go. All right? Let's talk about this for a minute. As we travel through this journey together, there are times, many times, in which we're afraid. And we're afraid of what people say they will do rather than what God said he will do, or what they might do versus what God says he will do. Listen to Psalm chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. The psalmist asks a very interesting question. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? I don't think the psalmist is questioning why people do the things that they do. I think the psalmist understands that fallen people do fallen things. But I think the question the psalmist is really act, actually asking as we look at this is why are, those, why are they so foolish in doing those things? 
Why are people in the world, why are the lost so foolish in raging against God? Why are the lost in the world so foolish as to plot against God in ways that will not work? It's vain. You're not going to best God. <laughs> you can't get up earlier than him, right? You're not stronger than him. You're not smarter than him. Now, we understand that the lost do this because they don't believe God is real or they certainly don't believe that God will do what he says he will do. That's the problem. But the psalmist is asking kind of a rhetorical question. Why would they be so foolish? Why do the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed? Why would the world ever think that the counsel of men is wiser than the foolishness of God, right? And the psalmist is asking the question for us in such a way that we can understand that the world and the lost of the world, the world system, is folly. It's futile. It's foolishness. It's vanity. It's vain that they are engaged in activities that are for their own glory, not the glory of God. They are moving by their plans, not the plans of God, and their end will be destruction as opposed to rest, uh, restoration or reconciliation with God. And so we can see as we begin here that, that as the world threatens us, as the world says, you can't meet as a church because there's this virus, and if you you meet as a church, if you gather up together, we're going to come and we're going to arrest you. Okay? There were some pastors during the period of time that was going on that chose to keep their churches open, chose to meet together. Some of them were arrested, some of them were not. But I don't know of any one of them that has not been vindicated after all of that has come out to light what was really going on. Right? Right? I don't know of any of them that were sent to death row because they violated the lockdown order. Do you? As a matter of fact, in our experience here at Grace Covenant Baptist Church, we actually grew during the COVID era. We didn't decline, we grew. Some of y'all came to us for the very first time in and around the time that we were supposed to be locked down for COVID. So it's easy to be afraid, it's easy to hear the threats of the removal of our temporal comfort, and yes, perhaps in extreme uh, circumstances take our, our temporal life, but you know, as a Christian, if my life is taken from me, what do I have to fear? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, is it not? I, I may not be excited about the dying process. But I can answer Davy Jones very clearly. No, I do not fear death. Why? Because there are only so many things that men can do, and after that, they can't do anything else. But God, who is unlimited in his power, unlimited in his knowledge, unlimited in his justice, unlimited in his goodness, can do things to me even after my body has been killed. And the, being, the killing of the body is the most extreme punishment that we as mortals can think of, right? But God can do much more after that. And yet many of us are fearful when the nations rage. We're afraid when we turn on the TV and we hear on Fox News that there's a war going on in Ukraine. We are fearful when an analyst comes on and says, well, I believe that the Russians are going to cut off all natural gas to the European continent and that they're going to somehow try to infiltrate our political system and they're going to try to influence our elections. Aren't we afraid? Now, be honest with me. I think we all had reservations, and we still have reservations when we hear those things, do we not? We are more afraid of a petty tyrant who lives on the other side of the world threatening to do all kinds of things to us in cyberspace. We're more afraid of him 
than we are of the God who lives within us. Does that make any sense? There are many people in this world today who are concerned that men are bursting their bonds apart and casting away the cords of God from themselves when we need not be fearful of these. In Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 30, we find actually the quotation of Psalm 2 in the text in Acts chapter 4. Verse 23 begins by saying, When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Verse 27, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your, your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word in, with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus Christ. What's happening here in Acts is that the apostles, I believe it was Peter and, and John, have been arrested. And the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, had called them in and said, you know what, guys? We're going to let you go, but you got to quit preaching. Now, the leaders had done that because they were afraid of the people. The people held Peter and James and John and the apostles in high esteem because the, the apostles, the disciples, were preaching and they were healing and they were bringing in God's word to bear on all kinds of circumstances. And, and people were seeing the light of the gospel. And people were being healed of their illnesses and demons were being cast out. They were doing signs and wonders. And the people had begun to take note of the disciples and the religious leaders of the day. The government understood that. And so they were afraid of the people. They were afraid of a revolt. And so they brought James and John and Peter and these other guys in. They arrested them and said, you must stop preaching. And you don't want to know what Peter and John and James and those guys said? They said, no, no. It's not that we're being rebellious against your authority. We're still living under your authority. We still recognize you as the civil authority over us. And so we are not breaking the law. We are not stealing. We're not lying. We're not killing people, that kind of stuff. But to stop preaching the word would be an offense to God and a detriment to the people. And so, no, we're not going to stop preaching. We're going to continue to preach. Now, in that circumstance, let me amend it slightly to bring it to our most uh, modern context. I believe that our civil magistrate, our civil authority, understands the power of the gospel. Perhaps they understand the power of the gospel better than many Christians do. I'm not saying that they're necessarily believing in the power of the gospel. I am just saying that they understand the power of the gospel. And so what has happened within the last three years or so is that the government has said, you have to stop preaching. You have to wear a mask or two masks or three masks. You have to wear a full body suit. You have to bathe yourself in alcohol. Or whatever, I'm just making stuff up. All right, don't go do this, okay? But I'm just saying the, the absurdity of the things that were said not long ago. You can't meet together. Isn't it interesting? <laughs> I found this fascinating that as all the lockdowns and things started coming down, and this is, not, this is not CNN in New York City. This is TV8 News in Monroe, West Road. This is what our governor was saying. They started off by saying, well, you can only 50%, only 50% of you can meet. So if you got a church of 100, only 50 of you can meet. I always wondered how in the world they were going to enforce that. 
But then that wasn't good enough. 50% wasn't good enough. And then they started to say, well, no, wait a minute. No, 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 no. you can only meet in, in groups of 50. If it's f more than 50, you can't meet. They actually honed it in, okay, 50. Well, then they went from 50 to 20 and 20 to 10. And then they finally came down, well, if you've got more than five people meeting, you can't, you can't meet. They just steadily walked it down, seeing how far they could push. And for a lot of churches, sadly, they were more afraid of the governor who sits in Baton Rouge than they are King Jesus who sits enthroned upon the heavens. And so they locked down. They didn't read Acts chapter 4. They didn't read Psalm chapter 2 and realize that the rulers of this world full of bluff and bluster with all kinds of saber rattling and threats have tried to stop the preaching of the gospel ever since the days of the disciples. You see what happens when you read your Bible? When you understand the Word of God, you know that that's been the case from, from time immemorial. And they were more afraid of the Pharisees or the government, the magistrate, whatever you want to call it, than they were of God. But the example that is laid before us by the apostles is no. No. We will not stop preaching the gospel. As a matter of fact, starting in verse 27, uh, they, they realized that there were others that were gathered against the Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed of God, and that it was God's hand. To, look at verse 28. To do whatever your hand, God's hand, and your plan, God's plan, had predestined to take place. God was sovereign. Christ is sovereign. He's doing what he's always planned to do. He's doing what he's planning to do right now. He's not gone anywhere. And so Peter and John and James and the other disciples, when they were confronted by those in this world that were trying to intimidate them and make them fearful, said no. I think they've been listening to Nancy Reagan. Just say no. Now, some of y'all will get it. Some of you won't. Bo says, just do it. Nancy said, just say no. Right? Now, this is not the gospel according to Nancy. Although I love the name, by the way. But I think when the world tries to intimidate us, we meet, need not be like many in the church today and be afraid of what men say they might do, but that we be afraid of what God said he will do and in the face of that controversy that we just say no. John Milton put it this way. He says, I cannot praise a fugitive and cloistered virtue an unexercised and unbreathed, that is unexercised and unbreathed, that never sallies out and sees her adversary, but slinks out of the race where the immortal garland is to be run for, not without dust and heat. What's Milton saying? He's saying, I can't support, I can't praise, I can't exalt, I can't even commend to you a faith that's not willing to get hot, tired, and dirty as it runs the race and fights the fight. As a matter of fact, a faith... A safe faith, now listen to me, a safe faith is no faith at all. A safe faith is no faith at all. Christ was not a safe man. The gospel is not a safe message. The cross was not a safe conclusion. And the interactions that we have in the world based upon those things that we say we believe is not a safe place. Now, Christ is a safe place. We've said that already. But our interactions with the world because of the abiding safety of Christ is not safe for us. And if so if you're worried about your safety, I'm not saying you're lost, but I am saying that maybe perhaps you're fearful of men more than you're fearful of God. Well, obviously Christ contradicts that thought, you're right. Christ says, no, I'm not safe. 
right? He's not a tame lion. He's a good lion, right? I'm so thankful to Lewis as he put that in the Chronicles of Narnia. No, he's not tame. What may, whatever made you think Christ was tame? He is good. He's not tame. He can't be put in a fancy little box. You can't control him. You can't put bounds around him. You can't say you can go this far but no further. No, King Jesus goes where King Jesus wants to go. And King Jesus does what King Jesus wants to do. And we as his people say amen, praise God, thank you, King Jesus. <laughs> right? And he reminds us of his sovereignty over all things, right? Christ is sovereign. Isn't it interesting that as we continue to deal and to, to interact with the lost world, that we interact with people who in some cases only give lip service to Christ's sovereignty, in worst cases deny his sovereignty completely and call themselves Christians, right? They, they give lip service to Christ's sovereignty. I was so appreciative of our speaker yesterday talking about practical um, liberalism, that we say one thing, but the way we live is completely different. And I was thinking as he was saying that, I hope y'all were thinking this too for those of y'all that were there. Well, that doesn't happen at Grace Covenant, right? If we say we believe it, we, we follow through with it, or we at least try to, right? And we say we're sold of Scriptura, which means we put into practice all the things that the Bible says. I, I appreciated that whole first session where he's hitting on regulative principle and sola scriptura and all those principles, all those doctrines that we speak of and live out so frequently here, right? Were y'all were y'all thinking what I was thinking? I hope you were. That we're not, we're not practical liberal people. We're actually living out our faith every day, that Christ is sovereign over all things. And we, we interact with people all over the place who at best only give lip service to that sovereignty. Now, y'all bear with me. I am going somewhere with this. This is not a rant. I'm actually leading up to something. And we deal with people all the time who deny or practically deny or out-deny out the absolute rulership of Christ over all created things. He might be sovereign over the plants and the animals and the fish and the sea and the birds of the sky and he might be sovereign, have absolute rulership over the people in China or Pakistan or Africa. He might even be absolute ruler over the people in California, as bad as they are, and the stuff going on in New York. But God is not absolute ruler over me. He might be absolute ruler over you, but he's not absolute ruler over me. That's what they say, right? Now, we've got various theological labels that we would assign to that thought process that I won't mention now. It's not beneficial. But we interact with people all the time who practically or verbally outright deny the sovereignty of Christ over all things and the absolute rulership of Christ over the entire created order. And they call themselves Christians. And sometimes we give them a pass because they call themselves Christians. We don't we don't challenge them on their thoughts. We don't confront their erroneous belief system. We don't say things like, well, well, how can you trust in an absolute sovereign ruler of time, space, and the created order if he's not sovereign over you? He either is sovereign over all things or he's sovereign over nothing. And so are you telling me that you have actually obliterated Christ's sovereignty because he's not sovereign over you? I mean, that's just one way that we might confront that erroneous thinking, that, that doctrine that's probably not thought out very well. And it's not that they're bad people, they just haven't thought it out very much, right? But Christ reminds us that he is sovereign, and Christ reminds us that he does have absolute, absolute rulership over everything. And here's why I'm saying it, verse 4, Psalm 2, verse 4. He who sits in the heavens, that is God, and I would argue Christ. Christ who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord, the Lord Jesus, holds them in derision. He mocks them for their 
foolishness, their futility, their, their vain thinking. God laughs at the lost when they think that they are him. And to a certain degree, we could argue, I think it is proper to say, that God laughs at those who practically or overtly deny his sovereignty. Because look, when you say God is sovereign over all things except me, then who's sovereign there? Who are you saying is sovereign? Who's in charge when you say God may be in charge of everything else, but he's not in charge of me? Well, who's in charge of you? Me. Didn't you just make yourself sovereign? Did you just say that I'm in charge of me? You know, just by way of reminder, I just thought of this. You know, there was somebody else who said that, right? Did you know that the biblical record gives us the account of somebody else who said, God is sovereign over everything else except me? Do you all remember what his name was? Is? It's Lucifer. The chief worshiper, the angel of light, Lucifer, said, yeah, look, God's sovereign over everything else. You remember that? You remember Job? I really, I got my head handed to me in Job, okay? All right, God's sovereign over all that. He's not sovereign over me, right? I can make my own decisions. I know what's best for me, right? Lucifer said that, and he fell from grace. So don't make the mistake of thinking that you can say that you make your own decisions and you're in charge of your own life and not be guilty of trying to replace God's sovereignty with your own sovereignty. You're not the first. But as we think about Christ's sovereignty, Jesus is, Jesus is not without his witnesses and presence in the world. He sits in the heavens, he laughs, he holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. God has his witness here on this earth, right? Did y'all hear what I just said? God has his witness here on this earth. God's presence is here. God hasn't gone anywhere. And if we think that our world is worse off today than, it what, than what has been at any other point in time in history, you're not a very good student of history. The world has been in much worse shape than what it is now. There's, look, now don't, I'm not denying there's bad things going on. There are bad things going on. And there are probably more of God's people being martyred today than there ever has been in the history. That's what the experts tell us. But the reality is, is the world is still as, in as bad a shape today as it's ever been. And in some cases, it's a little better. So God hasn't gone anywhere. As a matter of fact, and we've become blinded to the fact that the influence and the presence of God has actually brought in a lot of good things. Right? God hasn't gone anywhere. His presence is here, and he is not without his witness because King Jesus sits on the throne of this world. Now, I think that's a pretty good witness. And King Jesus has his witnesses in this world, right? It's called the church, the bride of Christ. No, I don't mean the plastic, artificial, man-centered, consumeristic church. I mean the bride of Christ. Christ is not without his witness in the world. It is the bride. And God is not without his witness in the world. It's the Son. There is no doubt, at least in my mind, and I hope in your mind, that God is alive and active, and Christ is alive and active and doing exactly what he has always planned to do in this world. November 2020 was not an accident. Now I realize that evil men did wicked things. I got it. But do you mean to tell me that God was surprised by November 2020? Not a chance. Nor was he surprised in November of 16. 
or November of 12, or 8, or 4, or 2000, or 96, or 92, or 88. And God will not be surprised in 24, 28, 32, 36, 40. We might be. Those all-knowing analysts over at CNN probably will be, but God will. Why? Because God is sovereign, and he's active, and he's present, and he has his witnesses. As for me, I have set my king on Zion. I have given not only my witness, but I have given my authority, my rule, my presence on this earth. In Matthew 23, verses 33 to 36, we find this witness speaking to the very idea of uh, God's presence in this world. The Lord Jesus said in verse 33, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you have killed and crucified. Some, of you, some, some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of uh, Berechiah whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon you, come upon this generation. Why is it that Jesus can make such a statement to the scribes and the Pharisees? Because he had his witnesses, and he had always had his witnesses, and he will continue to have his witnesses. The Lord Jesus is not without his demonstration of sovereign power in this world. Not only... Is, does he have a demonstration of his presence? Not only does Jesus have his witness in the world, not only is Jesus sovereign and ruling and planning and doing all the things that he's always planned to do in the world, he has a demonstration of his power in the world. Listen to Psalm 2, 7. Psalm 2, 7. I will tell of the decree. Ooh, I love that word decree. Do you remember that? Do you remember the eternal decree? The eternal covenant from Ephesians chapter 1, where before space and time, before creation, before Genesis 1-1, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit agreed in unison, the Godhead agreed to do all of the works of salvation before it was ever let there be light. Y'all remember that, right? All right, the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, friends, please don't mistake Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, as some have, as being a militaristic human government. Don't mistake when Isaiah 6 says, and the government shall rest upon his shoulders. Now, it is true there have been human governments, human agencies throughout time that have been founded upon gospel principle, have been founded upon the sovereignty of Christ. That is true, but that's not what these verses are talking about. They're talking about the eternal government of the Lord Jesus Christ when he will administer all things. And, and by the way... I would argue that Christ is currently ruling, reigning, and administering all things. Let me give you an example. In your mind, don't, you don't have to tell me, don't have to say them out loud, but in your mind, I want you to get fixed clearly in the center of your mind who your favorite president is. All-time favorite. Did the best job ever. All right, now for some of you Reagan conservatives, it's going to be Reagan. I got it. For some of you more moderate folks, maybe it's Bill Clinton. Maybe it's JFK. Maybe it's probably not Lyndon Johnson. Okay, we'll let that one go. Maybe it's George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, or Thomas Jefferson. Maybe it's one of those old guys. Maybe you're like me. You like those old guys. But I want you to get your favorite president of the United States locked into your mind, okay? Y'all got him? 
Do you think there were bad people in the country during his administration? Do you think there were rebels and insurrectionists to the great sovereignty of our nation existing, moving, and working under the administration of your favorite president? Of course there were. There always is. And even under King Jesus, there are those insurrectionists, seditious voices that are living, working, and acting to supplant his kingdom even under his administration. Does that mean he's not sovereign? No. Does it mean he's lost his power? It doesn't mean he is out of office. It just means in his case that he is being patient. Now, in the case of your favorite president, he may not have known. However, I would find that kind of really strange that a president doesn't know what's going on in his own nation. You know, now don't start going putting tinfoil on your windows to try to hide what you're doing in your house. But the government knows what's going on. They know. And because they don't do anything doesn't mean they're less sovereign as an as a administration, right? The president is not less the president if he doesn't deal with seditious people. And Christ is not any less king because he hasn't run out all the seditious people. My point is, is that the decree is today you are my son, I have begotten you. Ask of me of the nations and I will make them your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. There's coming a day when all of the sedition will be dealt with. That is true, but it doesn't mean that Christ is less sovereign just because that day hasn't come. Christ's power is still evident in this world if you know what to look for. Is there no one being saved today? Are all people who are lost in their sin just absolutely without hope and consigned to hell because there is no more salvation? Of course not. I think if we really knew what God was doing around the world, we would see that people are being saved perhaps by the thousands every moment of every day. Now, not here in the United States because we have become the great Babylon, but around the world, people are being saved in record numbers. Christ is still at work in the saving business, right? There is a power, there's a demonstration of Christ's message, Christ's gospel, Christ's rulership, his sovereignty over the world, and that he is still saving people. The nations are still being made his heritage. And the ends of the earth are still being made his possession. Just because we don't see it in our neighbors around our house doesn't mean it isn't happening. Right? But we get so consumed. <laughs> we get so consumed with what our boss tells us to try to control us or that bully at school tells us to try to give us make us give a, make us make us give him our lunch money we're so consumed with with our temporal comforts that when people begin to threaten them we get afraid that we're going to lose something that makes us feel good and we lose sight of the fact that Christ is still demonstrating his sovereign power even around the world Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. Romans 1, 1 to 6. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Paul says, I'm an apostle. I'm a bondservant. I was set apart for the business of taking the gospel message, the message of Jesus Christ to the world who had never heard the message of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said. And not only me, 
but all of those who come into the knowledge of Christ and are saved by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. All of those who belong to Jesus are called to be testimony, be salt and light in the world, to take that message that changed you into the life of somebody else who needs to be changed. Right? Isn't that what we call evangelism? Isn't that what we call the good news? Isn't that what we believe Christ commissioned each of us to in Matthew 28? To go into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Isn't that the hook that we as Baptists and Reformed confessional Baptists hang our hat on? And so that is the greatest demonstration of power known to mankind, known to all eternity. The leveling of mountains do not, does not compare to the salvation of a lost soul. Speaking in tongues, raising the dead, all kinds of ecstatic utterances, prophecies, pale in comparison to the miracle of the power of the saving message of the gospel. David Hume was wrong. Miracles have not ceased. If you're familiar with the philosopher David Hume, he denied miracles. And though I would argue that the Bible does tell us that there is a cessation of the miracle gifts, Miracles have not stopped because God is still saving people. Christ is still saving people. The blood of Christ is still being applied to people every day. And they are fulfilling that 2 Corinthians 5.17 verse that Brother Lamar made mention of earlier today. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. That old thing is gone, the new thing has come. And that's what Paul is saying. I have been commissioned to do that, and Christ is still at work. He has been raised from the dead, and he's still saving people by his grace. But there's even more. The Lord Jesus is not without his call to repentance in the world. Back to Psalm 2. Psalm 2, verse 10. The psalmist says, Now, in response to everything I have just said, Everything I've said in verse 1 to verse 9. All right, let's recap briefly. You are foolish to rage, to rage against God. You, it is folly for you to set yourself against God. That's verses 1 through 3. God has maintained a witness of his power, a witness of his presence in the world. Uh, today I have begotten you, or excuse me, I'm sorry. I have to, I've set my king upon the Zion, upon my hill. Okay, that's uh, verse 6. He has demonstrated his power. I have begotten you. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. All of this from verse 1 to verse 9, the psalmist says, Now therefore, verse 10, O kings, be wise. O rulers of the world, be warned. Let he who has ears hear what Christ says to the seven churches. Be warned. Hear my voice. And when you hear the voice, what are you supposed to apprehend? What are you to learn? Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. <laughs> Don't be afraid of the world. Don't be afraid of what happens to us in this fallen world. Fear the Lord and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. Love the Son. Honor the Son, lest he be angry with you and you perish in the way. Obey the Lord, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Can I ask you a question? What difference does it make in our thinking and our preponderance? What I mean is, is, as we are contemplating something that is disobedient. Now, there's some things we act in disobedience. We just do it in the spur of the moment. I got that. But I would argue that for most of us, for most of the time, 
Our disobedience before God is something we calculate. We ponder it. We think about it. We plan. And sometimes the planning is trying to get away with something so we don't get caught. I got that. But what difference would it make in our preponderances of sin if we realized in the moment that our sin kindles, what does it say? The wrath is quickly kindled. All right, let me just put it to you plainly. What difference does it make when you're thinking about sinning when you figure out and understand that God's going to get really mad at you about it? Does that make any difference, you think? Does your behavior change when you know mom and dad's going to be really angry with you? Are you a lot less likely to do something that you know mom and dad is going to be angry about? Right? See, as grown-ups, we've, we've moved away from that so far. We're so far detached in time from our parents. And our, maybe our parents are not even with us anymore. But we're so far removed from the direct wrath of parents over disobedience that we forget that God has wrath over disobedience too. And so Christ is not without his call to repentance in the world over the lost and over his church that we need to be warned. We need to understand that we have to serve the Lord with fear and rejoice in his grace, rejoice in his mercy, rejoice in his love, not in such a way that we just take advantage of it and do what we want to uh, because we know we can get forgiveness, but that we, we tremble before the Lord. There is a holy reverence of who God is. There is a holy reverence of who Christ is. Look, we don't need to watch the passion continually so that we're emotionally charged over the depiction of Christ's crucifixion so that somehow we feel motivated to be more obedient. Why would we not just be obedient because Christ is Christ whether we saw the movie or not? Do you follow what I'm saying? And I can say that to us today because Psalm 210 says, be wise, be warned. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, love the Son, follow the Son, obey the Son. Right? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, the writer of Hebrews says, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns us from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, the things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for God is a consuming fire. Fear God. Worship with trembling. Serve him with everything that you've got. Which leads me to the last and final thing today, the third thought, that we must remember that only, the only safe place is doing exactly what Christ says we need to do. <laughs> isn't, isn't it fascinating with the complexity of thought and argument that the psalmist puts into his text that is far beyond even my comprehension? that he comes down to this very, very simple thought. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. If you desire not to be afraid, now listen to me. If you desire not to be afraid, seek Christ. Abide in Christ. And you say, well, Rusty, I don't really know how to do that. That's fair. I got it. I got it. We all started there. There were times that many of us didn't know how to do that. 
But there were others that came along beside us and showed us how to do that. And now that we've been shown how to abide in Christ, and, and we don't have it down perfectly, but we're striving to abide in Christ, then we, we are charged by Christ himself to help others know and learn how to abide in Christ and to be a living example of what it means to live without fear because we're abiding in Christ. We are taking refuge in Christ. Look, the old song that we used to love to sing, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous run in, and they are saved. Right? That's a psalm too. We'll get to it one of these days. Abide in Christ. It, it may not make sense. It may be as weird as drinking raw milk. I got it. But it's the only safe place. It's the only safe place for us in our salvation. It is the only safe place in our jobs. It's the only safe place in our marriages, raising our kids, going and buying groceries, changing oil, cutting the grass, going to soccer games, whatever it is we're doing, Christ is the only safe place. Because only in him do we understand who it is that we should honestly fear. And all the others just fall by the wayside. Right? I remember when I was a kid, I think it was probably fifth grade, there was a boy in our class, and he was a bully. Yeah, I know you guys think bullies are the invention of the 2000s, but we had bullies when I was in school, too. And I remember in fifth grade, this kid, he, I mean, he was, he wasn't particularly big, but he was just mean. And he liked to fight. And I can remember in fifth grade just being terrified of this, of this kid. Right? Y'all know, y'all... Have y'all had a similar experience? In school, bully, feeling terrified? No? Oh, well, God, praise God you haven't had to deal with that. But if that, if that bully, that fifth grade bully, walked in the room right now, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be afraid of him. Right? You see, in that moment... As a fifth grader, with a limited perspective, I was afraid of the things that I saw with my physical eyes. Now, as a almost a 55-year-old, 50 years removed, I see that circumstance not with physical eyes, but through the lens of Christ, with spiritual eyes. And I realize even if this bully from fifth grade walks in, and just beats the fool out of me, other than being black and blue and bloodied for a while, I'm still okay, right? You see, Christ is my safe place. And even if I lose my life, based upon the promises of Christ, if I am believing in him and repenting in him, repenting of my sin then even if somebody kills me, I still have Christ. Right? We have to remember that. And it's easy for us to forget that. I know. It's easy for me to forget. But praise be to God, he's given us Psalm 2 to remind us, right? Right? You know, one commentator put it this way. He said, through the centuries, many schemes have been propounded for the f uh, uplifting of mankind and the bringing in the kingdom of God. The grand-sounding schemes have failed because they ignore the greatest power of all, that is, the regenerating power of Christ in the human heart. There was a man many years ago, Dr. Lyman Abbott. Now, I don't know Dr. Abbott, but he apparently was a prominent pastor in Brooklyn, New York. And after many years of service, he resigned his church. And he stated in his letter of resignation, I see that what I had once hoped might be done for my fellows through schemes of social reform and philanthropy can only be done by the influence of Jesus Christ. There is no dynamic in Reformation save the cross of Jesus Christ. 
Now, I'm assuming this is probably either the late 1800s or early 1900s, but it's the same thing we have going on today, right? We're trying to make people better by giving them jobs, giving them food, giving them clothes, giving them counsel, giving them education, giving them all these social things when really what they need and what we need is Christ. We need not take refuge in an education or a job or food or a house or position and standing in our society or our culture. We need only take refuge in Christ because that is the only safe place. Why do we not fear God? I fear, I'm afraid, I'm concerned that it's because we have not latched on to that final principle that the only safe place is Christ. We make Christ kind of like our uh, last resort, right? We make Christ our shelter room. I thought, I never saw that movie. It didn't really strike me as being something I was super interested in. But, you know, the thought is this, that we put so much effort and we put so much stock. And I think that was the theme of the movie, that the lady ran to the shelter room, right? Wasn't that the movie? Y'all remember that movie? Or am I just like hitting my head and dreamt it? She had this safe room in her house. Guy broke into the house, was trying to rob her, get her. She ran into the safe room. And she became a prisoner in her own safe room, right? And I, maybe I'm misquoting the name of the movie, but, but don't we do the same thing? Don't we, don't we have this safe room that we've constructed for ourselves and somebody breaks in, fear comes, and what do we do? We run to the safe room only to become a prisoner in our own house when we ought to run to Christ. Come unto me, all who are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. May God give us rest today as we cling to him as the only safe place, and as we do so, learn what a healthy fear of God really is. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given to us. We continue to praise you, Father, for your goodness to us for your mercy and for your grace. And we just simply ask that in the hearing of your word, that, Father, we would cling to you, that you would be our refuge, you would be our safe place, and that we would fear no other, that we would see the folly of fear of the world like the folly of being afraid of a fifth-grade bully. And we would realize that you mock and deride those who ascend to take your sovereignty. And they're foolish. And that, Father, as we see the world through your eyes, as we see the world through Christ's eyes, that we would understand that we need not fear what men say they might do, but that we would truly fear what you have said you will do that we would come to you as our only resort for the salvation of our souls, preservation of our lives and our families, and for the demonstration of your great grace and mercy. Father, move upon us in these ways that we might bring you great glory in this world. We love you, Father. We thank you. We praise you. And we ask these things always in your precious and holy name. In the name of the Father. In the name of King Jesus and in the name of his spirit, we ask.